shout. I have a loud voice. Everybody can hear me without the mic, so it's no problem. Cool. Awesome. Super excited for the second year of this conference. I'm glad Bill got you guys all waked up after, uh, after the meal. And now I kind of wanted to do a talk about building your own distributed database. I know it's kind of silly. You're, you're probably sitting there you're like, Matt, why would I want to build my own database? Like, and like the whole goal of my talk today is like for you to go back to your work and then convince everybody to build your own database and go and then have your manager hate me. So if I do that, then my talk has been a success. Cool. So why don't we just start off as like, what is a database? It's like kind of an existential question. It's like, what is life? You know, it's like, I don't, I don't know. It's kind of a very deep thing. So like, if we think about like, what's the simplest kind of database is a file, right? Maybe we have a CSV file. Maybe we have just binary data. We have JSON in it. You know, the file is kind of like the most simplest, stupidest database we could have. And then, you know, we can move up a level, right? And we have things that are like key value stores. We have things like LevelDB, BerkeleyDB, RocksDB, where they're just like really, really simple key value stores on binary data, right? And we keep moving up the, the hierarchy, right? And then we have something like SQLite, where like now we have concepts of tables, we have transaction logs. And we even have a query language, SQL, which everybody loves, and everybody wants SQL everywhere. Um, and then we keep moving to where most people in the audience are probably building their systems at, which is like MySQL or Postgres. We're like, OK, cool, we have a web app, we have some microservices, and we have MySQL Postgres, right? And pretty much the majority of the audience is probably sitting here right now saying, I have this, this is good for me. And I think for most startups, like if you have like a five, 10 person team, maybe you only have 10,000, 20,000 users, this is fine. But you know, like once we start getting into really interesting use cases, like let's say that you have to track millions of servers or you have your Facebook and you need to have tons of users, um, or maybe you're trying to build your own blockchain. There's lots of really interesting use cases where we might want to build our own custom database. And that's kind of what we're going to go into today. Um, so just really quick about me. I'm founder of Loom Network. We build blockchain software. Uh, before that, I used to build time series databases at uh, DigitalOcean. Um, I've been in the Go community for so long, I can't even remember actually how long I've been in it. And uh, I live in Thailand, um, so I had a really short flight. I know some people flew here all the way from Miami, so I'm, I'm not jealous of that flight. So. Cool. Awesome. Cool. So I think the first thing that's going to jump out to everybody, they're like, Matt, why do I need a distributed database? If I need one, I'll use Cassandra. I'll use Bigtable. I'll use Redshift. All these solutions. I say, yeah, sure. Those are pretty cool. So like when, uh, when I was at DigitalOcean, we built our own uh, metrics database. And we built one that could track millions and millions of servers on top of Cassandra. But when you build on top of something like Cassandra or Bigtable, you start to run into like two big issues. Let's say that you want to query data in a custom way. You want to have indexes that are not normal. You have to have indexes for every single use case that you could possibly ever imagine. And you don't have a query language. Or you have a very simplistic query language. So like, let's say that you wanted to have a very domain-specific query language beyond SQL. Like, so for example, we had a metrics querying language. So you could aggregate metrics across different machines. All these kinds of things are almost impossible to do on top of Cassandra. So that's where we get into like actually wanting to build our own database. So what are some of like the really the core use cases? I think blockchains. So I'm a bit biased. So I'm a big blockchain guy right now. And, but I think blockchains are one of the coolest new kinds of databases. So really, blockchains are just distributed databases, but they're actually super secure. So basically, that anybody can write into them as long as they pay fees. Um, so we'll get into that more later. Stock trading is really cool. So when I used to work at Bloomberg, we actually had custom time series databases. So that way, when you're doing trades, like the, the, the tickers can be very fast. Um, logging and metric systems. I think this is like one of the biggest areas. Obviously, I'm a bit biased because I've worked on multiple metrics databases, but I think this has been a really cool area where uh, new databases have come up. Yeah, so 
Who here knows anything about the blockchain or Bitcoin or has used it at all? Come on, a few people, like three people in the audience that are like, okay, cool. The second largest blockchain in the world is written in Go. So that's, there's 30,000 nodes running Go right now, and that's not including all the users that are actually connecting it to. So like, this is actually one of the biggest use cases of Go, and most people don't even realize that this is like, this is like a pretty big application. Um, you know, what are some of the other big projects written in Go? I was trying to list it out and I ran out of space on the slide. There's so many databases written in Go that are in production right now. I think probably everybody in this room knows like InfluxDB and Prometheus. Uh, like I was saying, we wrote our own at DigitalOcean, Ethereum, Blockchains, Etcd, Console. There's just, I can't, I could go on forever about how many databases are written in Go. So awesome. You're like, Matt, awesome. You convinced me. These distributed databases are so cool. I want to make my own. How does it work? What do I need to do? How do I sign up for this? Cool. All right, let's start. So let's actually just look at the architecture of what a distributed database looks like. And this is like really simplistic. And we're kind of like break down into each one of these pieces. And uh, you don't have to stare at this too long. We're going to break into it. But there's many different components. And before we actually look at a distributed system, we should look at MySQL, because this is the main one that most people are using. So what you'll see is MySQL has a storage layer, and it has transaction logs. But you as a developer, you never know about the actual key value store. So when you use MySQL, you always pick something like InnoDB which is just basically a transactional key value store. But there's all these layers that are actually taking your SQL statements and converting them into like key value store lookups or range lookups on indexes. And MySQL is doing this all in the background for you. So let's start at the, various, the very bottom level of building a distributed database, which is consensus. So let me go ahead and start this diagram, this little movie here. So consensus is basically saying, how do we make multiple machines agree about state changes? So this is actually a diagram from Raft, which is one of the, which is one of the consensus implementations. And basically what happens is, generally speaking, there's a single leader for a portion of the data set. And that leader will broadcast changes to the other nodes. And basically, once they become an agreement, they can commit that data, and then new data can be moved on. So like, that's the lowest layer. And this is actually one of the more complicated layers. But what's really kind of cool is in Go, we can just take, uh, there's three different Go Raft imp implementations. So you don't need to know anything about consensus. You can just take the etcd Raft layer, and boom, you have a consensus system that allows you to get distributed transaction distributed state spread across the system. Um, there's two other kind of consensus systems that I like to talk about. So the original is, this is all kind of based on this original paper called Paxos, which is kind of like the father of all these consensus systems. But now Raft is like a very simplified version. And there's something really cool which is called Byzantine fault tolerance. And that's where like Bitcoin and blockchain come in because they're actually a version of distributed databases where there's a lot less trust involved, whereas with Raft and Paxos, they generally assume that there's no bad actors in the system and that each of the nodes is typically not going to try to lie to the other nodes. So like, if you want to have a system where like, you have a public database where multiple people are using it, you might want to consider something like a Byzantine fault tolerance system. Um, so like I mentioned, for, for like, if we were going to start at our consensus layer, um, the HashiCorp Raft implementation is probably the de facto one right now that most people use, but the etcd one is still quite, it's quite usable. So, so we're at the bottom layer, and I know I'm kind of jumping through this because I'm in like 25 minute talk here, but like once we have consensus, and basically once we have the agreement that like, for example, like a user puts his email address into the database. All the nodes agree that they have that email address. 
well, we still have, we have to store that onto disk now, right? So now we need to have some kind of key value store on top of that that actually stores all this information. And we also have these things called transaction logs. So when we think of tables and like databases, typically like we're not actually getting, we're not actually, a table is really just a materialized view of all the transactions. And what do I mean is that like, let's say that a user creates an account and then the user like changes his email address or he changes his name. Each one of those, each update or insert statement is a transaction. And all those are in a transaction log and eventually they move into your primary key value store which is like then we can actually query at and we can make things like tables and materialize views on top of. And there's like amazing amount of choices. So the one we use internally is we use this thing called LevelDB. So uh, InfluxDB was using LevelDB for a while. Uh, Ethereum uses LevelDB. It's probably the most popular. And basically all it is is a key value store. That's it. It's a single node, single user key value store. And basically you build all the constructs on top of it. So you would take your PDP layer and as you're getting consensus among nodes, you can actually write things into this key value store. And you say, Matt, man, this is a lot of work. I just did all this work to like replicate a, a simple key value store and I'm not even at the point of where I would be with Cassandra. It really gets interesting when we get to the query layer. So right now, most database systems are queried using SQL. But if you take the Prometheus project, I love this tweet from one of the Prometheus developers. If you were to try to write a SQL language for querying metrics, you would have to write like a dozen lines of code to be able to like query metrics across a couple machines. They actually wrote their own querying language in Go and wrote their own lexer and parser and they were able to make a very domain specific language. And I think this is where we're going to see more and more interesting applications where like we can actually build our own query languages for di different domains. Like if we're in the stock markets, we could actually make a language that is actually specific to looking at stock tickers or time series data and these kinds of things. And there's quite a bit of good implementations of the query layer. So actually on the Go Academy website I found, it's quite old, but there's actually a great article about how to build your own parser and lexer. And it actually shows you in like 100 lines of code how to write your own SQL parser, which I didn't think was going to be so simple, but you can basically go from there. And like, for example, on my team, we have like our own querying languages for blockchains. Um, and then the other great examples are in the past, we use the Prometheus query language. And then InfluxDB has their own query language. They're all open source in Go. I mean, this is probably one of the one areas that's a little bit more tricky in Go, but I, I have to say these are some of the most interesting pieces of source you'll ever look at. Um, I think it's really exciting that we could go beyond SQL. Like, I, I think the world is being held back by just doing SQL everywhere. It's cool. So tying this together, like, like we get these little pieces together. We get, we get our, we have our P2P layer. We have our Raft. We have our Level DB. And now we've created our own domain-specific language. And now we can actually build applications on top of this. And I, I think this is where it's kind of cool. Like, for example, like with Ethereum, the blockchain, they actually build applications that run inside the database. So you can actually deploy new pieces of virtual machine code into the database and they get run inside the database and the results get committed back into the database. So then all of a sudden the application and the database like merge into one, like a transformers. And I think there's a lot of really cool applications for like when you need really high performance systems and you don't want your application and your database to be merged. And but this keeps coming back. So I, I was actually one of the co-founders originally on InfluxDB. And we started it originally on top of Cassandra. And we found that like we couldn't get the performance we wanted. So eventually we ended up merging it down into a Go binary. And that's actually how InfluxDB started. Is that it was a very custom, it was actually for a specific metrics application. And it turned out that it was it was able to be generalized for anybody wanting to build metrics-based systems. Um, 
gotchas. So obviously, I'm talking a lot of flowery logic about building distributed systems, and these is way harder than building your typical microservice architecture, right? Because these are very stateful systems. You have failures at basically every point. Like each server, you could have corrupted data. You could have transactions that are not being propagated. You can have network, you can have network splits. So this is like very complicated stuff. So like definitely like you want to isolate the number of use cases you want to use this in. But I, I think there's like a lot of opportunities though. Um, so from my, my experiences, I kind of gone into them. Um, the, the project that we're working on now is like we're actually building like custom blockchain software in Go. And we're trying to make it really easy for Go developers to build their own blockchains, right? And we're actually like actually building like Byzantine fault tolerance. And what we're seeing is, is that like it's pretty cool that like you can you can build you have a whole binary and you stick it on a machine and it has all the logic for your application and your database in one. And then you can replicate that to a hundred other machines across the world. And then they can all be part of one database and trust each other. So um, what are the main takeaways here is that I think that we're going to see a lot more custom databases written in Go. I hope that like, I know this was a very high level talk, but I kind of wanted to get everybody into the concepts of like building a database, where to get started, what libraries you need to use, and like the basic concepts. And feel free to grab me. And this is what I've been working on for the last five years. So I'm really excited about building these systems. And um, Last thing, we're definitely hiring. So if you guys want to work on blockchains, distributed databases, and I think I have a few minutes for questions here. Oh, cool. The questions are digital now. Yeah. I feel like we've advanced in time. I remember when people had to walk up to the mic. Cool. How about writing databases in Rust? Oh, this is great. So actually, quite a bit of my competitors are writing in Rust, and some of my competitors are writing in Go. So I think the problem is, is that Rust has just not been a very stable programming language. Like the APIs, the libraries have changed frequently. I have Go code that's in production for half a decade now, and it still runs. So I can't really recommend people to, to build stuff in Rust unless you don't mind rewriting your code every year. Uh, what about CockroachDB? Oh, CockroachDB is a great project. I believe it's a Go-based project also. Yeah, no, that's a super exciting one too. I've been following it. They're trying to ba basically build an infinitely scalable SQL database. Uh, I, I don't know of anybody in using it in production. Does anybody here use CockroachDB? This guy? Maybe the guy that asked the question? <laughs> um, but, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I mean... I, lo I love playing with database code, so that's just kind of my thing. Um, about scale, would you consider rolling your own DB versus things like Postgres with extensions? Oh, that's a great question. So when we were originally building a time series database at DigitalOcean, one thing we looked at was just building extensions to Postgres. Um, so that can very much work if you have sharded or isolated data sets. Once you start to have like terabyte or in our case, maybe 100 terabytes of data in the database. Postgres is not really a great database for doing distribution. But if you need a very specific use case, like say you were going to do like GIS or you're going to do like maybe a trading system, you could probably make a Postgres extension that could solve a lot of these issues. OK, cool. Uh, we have just another minute if anybody else just wanted to call out a question instead of using it digitally. I know, it's scary to ask questions, so it's all right. I'm not worried about it. All right, cool. All right, thank you.